Uh, here we go. Hey everyone, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, March 25th. 2016. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week we're going to be talking about uh, early flash of an exploding star, ancient polar ice and the tilt of the Earth's moon, supermassive stars, virgin galactic, and when Saturn's inner moons formed. But of course we've got a special guest as well. So uh, joining us this week we've got Brian Coberline. Brian! Hi! Wow! I'm finally back. What what is the break that you're on? Uh, I'm on spring break, so I have this week only, uh, and then I'm back on my teaching schedule at this time. That is awesome. We've got Kimberly Cartier. Hey, Kimberly. Hey, Frazier. Hello, viewers. You're somewhere, some kind of. I am in Cleveland too. right now, so this is my temporary office space. Uh, we got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, everyone gone for a week, but now you're back after uh, getting Congress to, to expand the planetary science. We can only hope. We can only <laughs> hope. And we've got very special guests this week. We've got Andrew Helton. Hey, Andrew. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on. And we've got Ryan Hamilton. Hey, Ryan. And now you can see Ryan's got some kind of hardware in the background. Ryan, where are Hello, you? Hello, everybody. And then, therefore, who are you and what do you do? So I'm in Palmdale, California. This is where uh, NASA's SOFIA's uh, telescope is based out of. Uh, it's a 747 with a big giant telescope in the rear. Uh, and this is one of the instruments that's going to be flying on SOFIA in just about three weeks. Uh, it's called Hawk Plus, uh, the high angular wide field camera upgrade or something like that. I actually always forget. High resolution airborne wide band camera. I should know that, but I always forget. And you actually said before we started, uh, so yeah, so, just go around the corner through a door there. There's the actual 747 right there. Oh yeah, like right like down. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll try to move slow so it's not just nauseating. But here's the door to the lab, and then we open it up. How? And there she is. That's Sophia <laughs> right there. Yes. Get my head out of it. So oh, you can see this is the. The, the door where people just come in in the hangar, the telescope's actually shaft. It actually looks out uh, towards that way. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, this is a, a big, nice, big hangar building. There's some other aircraft over there. That's the DC-8 that you can see. Uh, and past that is uh, ER-2s. It's basically U-2 spy planes that have been repurposed for uh, Earth uh, reconnaissance and, and observations. So, yeah, there's Sophia. <laughs> This is about the coolest thing I think we've ever had on the Weekly Space Hangout. This is just awesome. Uh, Andrew, so for people who, who sort of uh, don't know you, can you give yourself an introduction and then we'll learn more about the uh, about Sophia? Sure. Um, I'm a staff scientist at Sophia, and right now I'm sitting at the NASA Ames Research Center in the Bay Area in California. Um, this is where the science mission operations is located for the Sophia program. And uh, Ryan then is sitting at um, the Armstrong Flight Research Center, which is in Southern California near LA, um, where the aircraft is, of course, housed, and that's where the operations occur from. That's where all the flights take place. So here we're doing the science operations side of things. Right, and so for people who aren't familiar with SOFIA, I mean, can you give just an, an explanation of, of what you have done to the 747 and why? Sure. Um, so SOFIA is one in a long uh, sort of lineage of, of aircraft on which we've housed uh, telescopes of various uh, sorts. Um, the, the main idea is that uh, we're trying to observe in the infrared portion of the spectrum, which is absorbed quite efficiently from uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, water vapor, ozone, a number of other molecules in our own Earth's atmosphere. And so in order to be able to observe in the infrared, it really helps to get above that water vapor and to get as high as possible, preferably into the stratosphere where the water vapor content drops precipitously. And so if you can get into the stratosphere, you get above the water vapor and the atmosphere becomes more transparent. Um, and the advantage of doing this over space is that uh, it's much cheaper than going to space. Um, and you have a ground-based platform, so you can work on instrumentation, you can swap instruments, you can improve the, the technology without an expensive uh, program to 
take the shuttle to you know to to the observatory, you know, uh, like a Hubble servicing mission. Um, and so uh, the the first observatory was just in a Learjet. It was a very small. I don't remember exactly what the size was, about 18, 20 inches, something like that. Pretty small. Um, and that was in the 70s. And then after that, they had the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, and that operated through the 90s. So it had a nice long li lifetime. Um, and then this was the latest in that tradition. Uh, it's a two and a half meter telescope, and it's mounted in the size, uh, the side of a 747 SP. Um, the SP stands for Special Performance, and it was uh, one of about I think 40 or 50 of these uh, specially crafted 747s that were designed for long haul flights. Um, this was before, it was built in the 70s, so this was before the time when they had the high efficiency jet turbine engines, and so um, they had to decrease the weight in order to get long flight times out of these aircraft. So they would shorten the fuselage uh, significantly, so it's much shorter than a normal 747, um, and then that allowed them, of course, to, you know, 17 plus hour flight times. Um, so in order to mount the telescope, then they would cut a large hole into the side of the fuselage, and that was a, a really long, complex um, engineering process to do that. And it was done by L3 in Waco, Texas. Um, and th the hole in the side of the, of the aircraft is about the size of a garage door, so you could drive a truck through the, through the, the hole through which the telescope is observing. Um, and then there's a pressurized bulkhead that separates the cavity in which the telescope sits from the rest of the main cabin where all the crew are actually actively working throughout the flight. And that pressurized bulkhead is designed um, to withstand the pressure pushing out from the pressurized cabin. Um, and it amounts to about 250,000 pounds of pressure on that bulkhead once we're at altitude. Um, then the telescope is mounted on a, a spherical bearing in that bulkhead and is free floating so it can move with the motion of the telescope so that it's inertially stabilized in flight to keep you on target. And so those are some of the engineering challenges they had to deal with with, 4K, with uh, Sophia. So Ryan, I'd love to sort of talk about what happens you know, leading up to and actually doing a, you know, a, a mission because, you know, how much flight time do you have? How do people get their, you know, get your instruments on board? How long does the loadout happen? So I'd love to hear sort of leading up to and actually performing a mission. That was very nebulous. So the questions. observatory works at every other... Uh... <laughs> no, it's okay. The, uh, the observatory has observing cycles. Usually they're timed to be around a year. Um, just like Hubble and, and other are supposed to use the telescope and, and use the instruments that we have at, here at the observatory. Um, then it goes kind of into a big pot. Everything gets mixed around, and they try to find optimal scope. They try to group things together, and hopefully the, the time of year is right for the objects that they want to look at. Uh, so it becomes a very, very uh, complicated process to schedule everything appropriately. Uh, since the telescope only points out one side of the aircraft, um, if we want to look at something else in the sky, we physically have to turn the plane. Uh, so we end up with crazy crisscross uh, open and, or not open, we, we take off and land at the same place, uh, but we end up with very complicated polygons and, and crisscrossing uh, flight patterns. Uh, which are very hard to deal with just because there's different restricted airspaces in the US. Uh, there's some military bases that we have to fly around and avoid. Uh, and also the, the, the airspace just off of the LA, LA coast is uh, very, very busy. So uh, we have to basically thread a needle to get up uh, and into the LA corridor to, to land here in Palmdale. Um, loading an instrument on the observatory takes about two days. Um, it, it, all the big stuff happens in a day, um, but cabling and checkout processes and various things uh, usually extend it out to two days. Um, but it's a, it's a very kind of hair-raising experience because there's no there's the big garage door that the telescope is in, but there's no other doors in the aircraft. It's just standard passenger doors. Uh, so all of the instruments have to fit through a standard passenger door. Uh, on the side of the aircraft, so it's a it's a very very thin thing that we have to put these giant instruments in through. Um, so it's a uh, it's it's a very long process. It it can take a little bit of time to get it all right. 
Uh, the plane flies for about 10 hours. Um, we usually get about seven and a half to eight and a half hours, depending on the scheduling and the efficiency of what's going on. Um, it takes us about a half hour to take off, a half hour to land, uh, and then there's a, a half hour of setting up the telescope and making sure it knows where it is in the sky uh, once we get started. Um, but uh, it's, it's pretty amazing to see in flight. Um, the, the telescope is stabilized with respect to what we're looking at, uh, so whenever there's turbulence, uh, you can see if you're looking at the, the back end of the telescope where the instrument's mounted, it does kind of jiggle up and down and bounce and kind of bob and weave, uh, but it's actually staying fixed with respect to the source that we're looking at. Uh, if you want to look at it in the other reference frame, the plane is pivoting around the instrument in order to keep it steady. Uh, so it's it's pretty impressive to see in, in action. It's, a, it's an amazing feat of engineering, at least, if, if nothing else. Uh, Andrew, so, you know, it's a infrared observatory, and so I'd like to talk a bit about sort of like what, what are the kinds of targets that you're most wanting to observe with, uh, with that? What's it really specialized in? Sure. Um, so I actually support a mid-infrared instrument on board, Sophia. It's called the Forecast Instrument. Um, and that instrument is designed to observe in what we call the thermal infrared. So this is about 5 to 40 microns in wavelength. And um, at those wavelengths, what you're really looking at is uh, warm dust and gas in, uh, in the universe. And uh, so that instrument in particular tends to focus on observations of star-forming regions or massive stars, stellar explosions, um, all different stages of the stellar life cycle. Um, but we also tend to focus on a lot of planetary science as well. So we've done a number of observations to observe comets and asteroids in our own solar system as well. Pretty much anything that is in that thermal infrared portion of the spectrum. Um, but in terms of the entire instrument suite, we actually have capabilities ranging from the um, optical almost down to the UV through about 240 microns. Um, the optical observations are oftentimes used in uh, exoplanet studies where they're actually looking at exoplanet transits and they're doing that at uh, high cadence. So uh, they're taking images uh, every uh, a few times a second. Um, and then we're also using those uh, instruments to observe uh, occultation events. For example, um, in 2011 and again in 2000, I believe just last year, 2015, uh, we were able to observe the occultation of a background star by the, uh, the small body Pluto as it passed in front of it in order to learn about the atmosphere of Pluto. And I believe Ryan was on both of those flights. Yep. Um, and then when we go out to longer wavelengths, then we're targeting um, oftentimes a lot of uh, molecules. So, for example, um, there are recent observations of a young star where we, will, we were able to observe water vapor in that star to identify the structure of the infall region as that star, as the cloud surrounding that star is collapsing to, to form that, new, that newborn object. Uh, Ryan, so that sounds great. You were sort of participating in, in doing some occultations with Pluto, I guess in concert with what was happening with New Horizons? Yeah, it was um, kind of crazy how, how well the event ended up being timed. Uh, it happened just before, I think it was two or three weeks just before New Horizons' closest approach, uh, and this was an occultation of the brightest star Pluto had ever occulted, um, and it happened to be exactly or almost exactly over Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, which was where Sophia uh, was on its southern deployment. Uh, so it was just a, a really kind of amazing alignment of everything to make it all work out in terms of timing. Uh, and it's, it's a very hair-raising and very complex uh, timing of things because we have to be, we were trying to get in the exact center point of where Pluto's uh, shadow was moving across the Earth. Um, if we were at that exact basically geometric center of the shadow, Pluto's lens or Pluto's atmosphere acts as a lens uh, on that background's light star. And uh, in the very center of the uh, occultation, the light that we're seeing, instead of uh, kind of going down as Pluto goes in front of the, the star, it actually rises up in what's called a central flash, right in the very geometric center where uh, Pluto's atmosphere lenses the light and enhances things and makes things temporarily very bright. Uh, and we were able to see that. Um, you have to be very, very, very close uh, to the center of the occultation in order to catch that. 
uh, it ended up being um, the team from MIT who was uh, working with us, and they were the ones driving the investigation. Uh, they literally were working out the details from observations they had gotten uh, earlier that day, uh, and they used a satellite phone to call from uh, Lowell Observatory to us on the plane in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and it's not a very easy thing to talk on a satellite phone. It's it's like talking over a, a, an old 2400 baud modem. Uh, you basically, it's good for text messages and not really voice or anything. So it, it took a few tries to get the... Uh, to get the, the information to us, but we adjusted our, our trajectory and, and the flight path and uh, the flight path, and we got uh, basically right on target. Uh, that's, that's that's awesome. Um, you know, talk a bit about the the instruments. You've got the instrument that's there behind you, and saying this is sort of getting prepared for your for your next mission. Sort of, how many of these instruments do you have kicking around, or are new ones supplied for? for various uh, experiments that people want to do? So uh, the observatory has, uh, I think, six or seven instruments. I'd have to count them. Um, but um, they're all available for use uh, at various times. Some of them are led by what's called uh, principal investigators, or PIs. Uh, these are instruments that are built by a specific team for a specific purpose. And if you want to use their instrument, you have to kind of collaborate with them and work something out. Uh, so we have a few of those. Uh, but uh, Hawk here behind me is what's called a facility instrument. So this is going to be delivered to the observatory. Uh, we're going to take over operations and maintenance of it, um, and we will have it available for use uh, whenever uh, the community uh, proposes for it. Uh, so this was uh, being, it originally started at University of Chicago. Um, uh, at some point, I think it was 2011 or 2012, it was selected for an upgrade, uh, and that upgrade was a uh, a, a combined team of JPL and Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Goddard built uh, brand new detectors that went into the system, uh, and JPL built a uh, polarimetry assembly. Uh, so that really lets us uh, dig into the details of magnetic fields and dust and things like that uh, in the far infrared, uh, which is a, a tremendously unique capability for the observatory now. Um, so we're just getting this guy ready for flight, uh, like I said, about three weeks or so. Uh, we're in the lab here. We're actually mounted to a simulator of the telescope to help us uh, figure out alignment and do basic like, uh, fit checks and things like that, make sure there's no last-minute surprises. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a long process of working in the lab here. Uh, you can see uh, the instrument itself. You might be wondering why there's these uh, little orange cones around. Uh, the instrument detectors, uh, they're cooled down to 0 0.13 degrees Kelvin. Uh, so it's below one degree Kelvin. Uh, it's not easy to do that. We have to do it uh, using what's called an adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator, or ADR. Uh, it basically uses uh, a magnetic field, a very strong magnetic field, to uh, the, the details are, are, I won't get into it, but it, it, you use a magnetic field to align something to that magnetic field. It's able to suck up energy in the system. Uh, as that magnetic field goes away, uh, the energy in the system kind of randomizes the magnetic field in that in that working material that we have inside of it, and it's like it removes heat from the system, and that lets us get down to below one degree Kelvin. Um, so that's uh, while that's running, the the cycle is actually running right now. It's actually a, uh, a magnetic field. It's it's fairly strong. These are just uh, emergency kind of safety limits of if we were running the magnet at a very high strength, which, we're, which we don't plan on doing, uh, this uh, the barrier actually is the limit uh, where the device can uh, interfere with uh, pacemakers and medical devices and things. Uh, so this is just our little safety boundary to make sure that you know everything's safe in the lab here. There's no problem, but uh, this is just just in case something is unexpected. Um, right. If you don't want to get your phone wiped, don't get any closer. <laughs> Yeah, the, the joke is don't hug the cryostat while the ADR is running. You'll, you'll wipe your uh, badge or your credit cards. Right. Uh, Andrew, I got a question for you from Nancy Graziano, who uh, helped set up this interview. Uh, and she wants to know how many um, missions are you able to run in a year? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, we're still slowly ramping up to what we hope to be our 
our final observational cadence. And in the end, we hope to get to 110 to 150 flights a year. Um, right now, uh, this year, we're, we're shooting for 100, uh, about 102, actually. Um, they're divided up into a flight series where we'll take one instrument, in some cases two, if they can be co-mounted, uh, put it on the observatory, and then fly for a few weeks at a time. And during that period, we'll generally have three to four flights per week. Um, and then after that, there will be uh, an instrument swap that might take a week, maybe a little bit more, before we put on the next one and then do the same thing. And so the overall cadence then is driven by science demand on individual instruments. I would, you know, when, I, when you think about like the amount of flight time that you get, if you get 150 missions and you're doing observing and you're getting up above the clouds, I mean, it's a pretty, you're getting a lot of observations done, even compared to some of the mountaintop, you know, when you think about some of the stuff in Chile or in, in Hawaii, you know, the amount of observing time that you're getting probably rivals them or sometimes beats them because you just, you know, you can just get so much time up there with the telescope. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's um, it's quite a bit of time on the sky. It hardly rivals, you know, sites with 300 good observing nights per year. Um, in part, we are uh, we have one crew of pilots on board, and that actually is oftentimes a limit on our effective observing time during during the night, um, especially in the in the winter. Whenever the nights are very long, we don't necessarily have the opportunity to make full usage of that night's worth of observing, and that's not due to the aircraft uh, itself. The aircraft could easily fly long enough to observe for 12 hours on a long winter night. Um, the real problem is crew, and since we have one flight crew on board, they have a fixed period of time that they're allowed to fly, and they have to land within that window. Um, and so that's really our restrictions in terms of like the the uh, individual flight efficiencies uh, for a given night. Um, but yeah, with 100 flights uh, a year, I mean we're we're talking six or seven hundred hours of good observing during uh, each year each cycle. Now, you say that this is the sort of latest in a long lineage of, of airplane-based observatories. Mm -hmm. Are there plans in the future for other, you know, other observatories, larger telescopes, other platforms? Uh, that's a really good question. I don't think there is currently any plan for the next generation after SOFIA. Uh, when we were going into the design of, of SOFIA, which, you know, the design process has been quite long. I mean, it's been in the works for well over a decade. Um, when we went into that, the, the specifications were for an expected 20-year lifetime. And so we're hoping that that will take us at least through JWST. And then after that, I don't think there's anything else really on the table right now. Um, in terms of like aircraft capabilities, a 747 is about the biggest fuselage you can get. I mean, you can get a little bit larger if you go into like an Airbus, uh, one of the new Airbus, whatever it is, 380. Um, but uh, but it's not going to get you that much more in collecting area. Um, so it's not clear what the next step is going to be after Sophia's lifetime. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by these various platforms. There's the you know the rocket based observatories and the and the balloon based mm -hmm. observatories and 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 this is great. It feels like a really great uh, balance in between them. So what uh, so what's coming up sort of in the you know in the next little while? What's something that maybe people should be sort of keeping their eyes out and watching for news? Oh, that's a good question. So um, one of the observations that is really exciting and that uh, hopefully will be published very soon are the observations that Ryan was just talking about, um, where the, uh, they perform the occultation observation by Pluto of that background star. Um, there's been a lot of work being done on that data, and it looks like it's just about ready for publication, and so that'll be really exciting. Um, coming up. Um, we have quite a number of really excellent observations that have been performed of the galactic center in our own Milky Way galaxy and some of those have already been published um, in part by Ryan Lau and Terry Herter out of Cornell University and they have some really exciting results um, about the, uh, the massive black, uh, black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy and the galactic, uh, the structure of um, gas and dust in a ring that's falling into that black hole. That's really fascinating. Um, and they also have some really interesting observations of a supernova remnant that's near the galactic center that gives us some idea of the amount of dust that survives uh, a supernova eruption. And so that's really exciting too. And that just recently came out as well. So there's a lot that's in the works. So hopefully 
there will be more soon. That all sounds that all sounds fantastic. Uh, okay, so we're just reaching the the end of our time. Uh, Ryan, why don't you let people know where they can find out more if they want to sort of follow your story on the internet? Yeah, so um, I have my uh, Twitter handle in the in the little tag underneath of me there. Uh, I just posted some pictures from the lab. Um, I'll be doing that in the in the run up to the flight series as well, and uh, they'll also be uh, going out to the uh, the Sophia. Uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook channels as well. Those are the probably the best places to get uh, up-to-date information. Uh, usually whenever we do an instrument swap, you can find out the quickest and easiest just by looking at the, the Twitter, and usually there's a picture of whatever instrument is on the telescope at the time. Uh, and then the general uh, NASA and SOFIA web pages, which um, we can uh, send in some way. I tried to do it in the chat, but it wouldn't let me. Uh, I'm not special enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I let you post a link. Yeah, yeah. Which is understandable. Um, no problem. Uh, we'll put we'll put all the links in the in the show notes for this episode. So so no problem. All the links will be there. I especially like your uh, your Instagram channel, which is one of my favorites. You got lots of great pictures of of the of sort of inside the flight and and stuff. So it's it's great. There's just great photographs of the airplane and also the 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 science work that you guys are doing. So it's all great. Mm-hmm. Well, Andrew and Ryan, thank you so much for joining us for the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, get back to the science. you got a lot of prep work to do and uh, another successful mission. And, uh, you know, when you do discover some really interesting stuff, uh, please come back and, and let us know. Well, Sounds good. Yeah, thanks right. so much for having us. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. It was fun. All right. Bye, everybody. All right, uh, let's move on to some uh, some of the stories that happened this week. Uh, Kimberly, tell us about uh, the early flash of an exploding star. Sure. So this was a very exciting thing that we learned about this week. Uh, it happened, it was uh, observed by the Kepler Space Telescope, which most people know for its wonderful observations of thousands of extrasolar planets. And that was really what it was designed for. But in addition to observing the 150,000-odd stars in the Kepler field, it also managed to capture observations of about 500 very distant galaxies that are also aligned with the Kepler field. Uh, and it observed them with the exact same cadence that it observed exoplanets, so one observation about every 30 minutes or so. And while it was looking, uh, they actually found two supernovae that happened in these galaxies during the primary Kepler mission. And what was truly exciting about it is that one of these supernovae that uh, Kepler observed, they were actually able to capture the very first flash of the supernova. It's called a shock breakout, which happens right when the uh, collapsing core of this supernova, when it shocks back outwards, when it sort of rebounds. The shock breakout is the first time we see all of that amazing supernova energy rebounding from the core and the first time it breaks out of the outer shell of the star and it releases an incredible amount of energy in a very short time. These flashes are uh, occur over about 20 minutes or so and so normally we never would be able to see this first shock of a supernova but Kepler just happened to be looking and because it has such a short uh, observational cadence we could actually observe the first flash of the supernova and then uh, and then all of the um, uh, expanding supernova energy afterwards as well. Uh, but what was also very particularly interesting was I mentioned that they observed two supernovae, but they only observed one that had this shock breakout, which was it was interesting because uh, we didn't really realize that these kinds of supernovae, these core collapse supernovae, could have different mechanisms. They don't all look the same when they core collapse. And that was something we'd never observed before. Uh, but I thought that was so cool. You never you never catch a supernova right when it's starting. <laughs> and we just happened to be looking and Kepler just happened to see it. Like one of the questions that we always have is like, you know, Betelgeuse or Eta Korea, mm-hmm. when are they gonna go? Come on already, Betelgeuse. There's Give us that no second indication. star in the sky. Yeah, I mean, uh, a star will be the... a, a star will be a red supergiant for hundreds of thousands of years, and there is no uh, warning sign when it's about to go supernova. So yeah, we don't know when Betelgeuse will happen or or any of the other ones, and so we can never. It's only really serendipitous when we happen to catch it, and maybe we catch it a, a few days late when it's already gone through the the first stages of supernova. Now we're sort of catching it on the rise of brightness, 
as it expands. And so this is one of the, this is I think the first one we've ever caught right as it flashed. And then we were able to observe the full from, the full sequence from red supergiant through the flashing and all of the uh, subsequent brightness and then dimming of this supernova. So it's a full supernova sequence that we were able to catch for the first time. But with with the Kepler observatories, like, did they find it in the data afterwards? Or, yeah. I mean, they didn't get any kind of alert that it was happening. It's not like it was swift, mm -hmm. where they're like, there's a supernova happening right now. Quick, hurry, let's let's take a look. Yeah, that would have been nice. But no, they were still combing through the four years of primary Kepler data. And the way it was set up was that uh, the data pipeline for Kepler was designed specifically for exoplanets. And anything else that happened to fall in there, we, we were able to catch, but we're still going through all of the backlog of data, and so we only just now realized that we had observed this supernova flash, and uh, the flash occurred in 2011, and we're just now finding it. So five years later, there's still an amazing amount of science and data to go through from the Kepler mission. It's it's interesting to think about some of the other things that Kepler can be used for. I mean, as you said, right, it was planned for planets, but but this is sort of like a hint of what we might see with the with the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which we keep yeah. going on and on and on about here, which is that there's some real value to go back and look at the same part of the sky again and again and again with a fairly rapid cadence to see things that are changing in that in that region. Right, so. and usually with galaxies and the wider universe, we don't ever have a chance to observe any phenomena that happen on uh, short, really short time scales, even on like a human lifetime, uh, let alone 20 minutes. Uh, we never have the chance to do that, and so Kepler, this this observation with Kepler is very serendipitous and very exciting. It can, like you said, give us a hint of what we can look forward to with LSST. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, Brian, let's talk about supermassive stars that aren't. Okay, well, they, they are supermassive stars. Uh, this is actually ultraviolet observations of a cluster known as R136. And the largest known star that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is 136A1, which has a mass of about uh, 265 solar masses. So 265 times the mass of the sun, which is extraordinarily huge for a star. And pretty much... We're not entirely sure how stars greater than about 100 solar masses actually form. And the kind of prevailing model has been that they would form from collisions between two large stars. So two large stars merge, and it creates this very large supermassive star. Well, this recent survey, this ultraviolet survey of 136, found nine stars bigger than 100 solar masses in this one cluster. It's not a huge cluster. It has it has about 70 bright O-type stars. And so to find nine of these large stars within a single cluster, the odds of that happening just for mergers is pretty unlikely, particularly given the fact that this cluster is only about one and a half million years old. So, so there really wasn't enough time to really merge. But these couldn't stars. these stars just form from clouds of gas that happen to have that much mass in them? I mean, there's a, there's a process that stops them from working that way. There is. There's, there's something called the Eddington limit. And basically, as a, a large quantity of gas were to collapse into a star, it would heat up. And, and a really large quantity of mass would heat up very quickly. And that would tend to push away any of the surrounding gas and dust. So basically, if it formed as a, as a super large star, you would think that it would start to collapse, it would heat up really quickly, and then that outer material would get pushed away, so it couldn't collapse into the star. So how you're getting that much collapsing before it heats up, we're not sure. So, but I mean, we just threw out all the theories on how you can get a star that big, right? You Basically, be, yeah. <laughs> it can't collapse under the under their own mass from all of the material, and you can't have right. two stars crash together because it's sort of statistically impossible. So, how do you get that many stars with that kind of mass? That's a good question. So, Thank you. Some, somewhere our understanding is is not clear. We don't know how these types of stars can form. And what's interesting about this recent research is that they. They looked at this particular cluster, and this is one where they can see the individual stars. 
Uh, but they also notice that these bright stars have a particular uh, emission line known as Lambda 1640. And they've looked at other clusters, particularly ones in, in nearby galaxies, and they find that same signature. And it's dominated by really large stars. So when you're finding these signatures elsewhere, it's, it's pointing in the direction that other clusters are also containing these supermassive stars, which means, again, it points to the idea that this isn't just a fluke. It's fine. So now you can see more of them. But, you know, what is the mechanism? I mean, now, now we, I recall uh, you talking about sort of uh, simulations of stars in the very early universe that had potentially maybe tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun, right? Some of the supernova, right. supernova simulations and how these big stars could form. So, I mean, could it be like what they're made out of that, you know, if they're a more pure form of hydrogen, they can they can form into those bigger masses? It, it could be. I think, I think the larger question is going to be large stars like this aren't stable over the long term. And so they, they reach some kind of pseudo-equilibrium, but they're not like main sequence stars that are going to go for billions of years. They're going to last for a short period of time. So there's probably something in the dynamics that allows them to form uh, that we don't fully understand. So, so it, it's very possible that they're forming from gravitational collapse of, and some mechanism that we're not familiar with is, is allowing them to collapse long enough to become stars. Uh, even like the 268, whatever it was, the, you know, the R1A1, that, that one even, 136? Two, one, yeah. 265 solar masses, yeah, the R136A1. Yeah, yeah. Even that is, could be that it just collapsed directly. It, yeah, it's possible. I mean, it. I, I think you're going to find some stars that will form from mergers, but the fact that we're finding so many in a single cluster kind of pushes away from the idea that that's the only mechanism by which these stars can form. How long would those kinds of stars live? Uh, I don't know the lifetime offhand. I would probably say on the order of tens of thousands of years. That's amazing. The worst seeing... O-types only last about a million years or so. Yeah, and the more massive they get, the quicker they're going to die. And so right. we just we happen right. to be seeing this huge cluster within a few tens of thousands of years of when they're all going to detonate. Right. That would be amazing to see them. Cool. Okay. Um, Morgan, let's talk about uh, Virgin Galactic. Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago I talked about how NASA was funding research into supersonic flight uh, with the intention of reducing basically the noise and increasing the efficiency of, of these planes to make them more commercially viable for rapid transit uh, of passengers across the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Uh, and what we learned this week was that this isn't simply an effort being undertaken by the government. It's also being uh, looked at by private industry. Uh, and this came about because of an agreement signed between uh, Virgin Galactic and an aerospace company uh, somewhat strangely named Boom. And uh, what Boom would like to do is sell you a ticket from New York to London uh, for a journey that would take less than three and a half hours for just $5,000 a round-trip ticket for $5,000. Uh, and they say that you could take off, uh, say, from London in the morning, conduct your business in New York, and return in time for dinner uh, that night uh, back in London. And what they need is to do a couple of improvements over the Concorde. They need to make it uh, more fuel efficient. Fuel certainly is more expensive now than it was several decades ago. Um, and they need to make it quieter. And in order to work on both these uh, things, they've signed an agreement uh, with Virgin Galactic. And we know Virgin Galactic for uh, being the first company to want to launch commercially uh, people into space, uh, space tourism. And they think that Virgin Galactic can provide some of the engineering know-how that they've used when developing uh, their uh, reusable spacecraft for this uh, high-performance supersonic jet. Uh, and so they're going to be working with Virgin Galactic to make use of this in engineering knowledge. And in return, they're going to offer Virgin Galactic uh, the chance to buy the first 10 jets that they produce. Uh, and this would give, uh, if successful, give Virgin Galactic uh, a more steady business 
uh, here on the ground, uh, point to point, rather than what can only be imagined as a, a relatively low volume business launching uh, space tourists. Uh, and this this company, Boom, says they've identified 500 uh, point to point routes uh, currently served by long haul aircraft that could instead be served much more rapidly, two and a half times as rapidly, by uh, their new uh, supersonic jet. So w what kind of jet are we looking at? I mean, are we looking at something that's like the Concorde or something that's more like a Virgin Galactic, like something... Oh, uh, it's much like more a... like, like the Concorde. Uh, and just like the Concorde, they're taking pains to uh, make the, the thing as light as possible. And so it's only going to have 40 seats arranged, uh, one on each side of an aisle, so 20 rows of two seats. And instead of having big, fancy, lie-flat, uh, sort of first-class seats like you might take on a long-haul jet, it's much more going to be like domestic first-class, where you have a nice, comfy chair, but that's about it. And that makes it a lot lighter and therefore more fuel-efficient, also faster, and it lets them accomplish the whole thing um, Carrying people sort of in the way we've always imagined carrying, we're always done carrying people, uh, but just over much longer distances that way. So how would this then compare to what the, I mean, you, you mentioned sort of like it's less people on the plane, maybe not, but I mean, I've been inside a Concorde, you know, on the ground, and it's, it's a pretty cramped experience inside there. They're not very big aircraft, so... I'm just wondering from a business model standpoint, what, what's different today than maybe was the case 20 years ago when you could fly from Paris to New York City in three hours on the Concorde? I mean, well, I think what they would say is that the Concorde operated for more than a quarter century, and in order to achieve a level of reliability and financial stability that would keep this uh, as you know, a profitable business, you don't need a huge improvement on a quarter century of operation. Uh, and I believe that they're saying that they'll be about 30% more efficient uh, and about 20% quieter uh, than the, the Concorde. And they're banking on the notion that that will be a sufficient increase to allow them to make a profit uh, on these flights. Right. I mean, I, I, and you can look back in previous episodes of, of this show where I predicted the, uh, the future of Virgin Galactic, which is, you know, going up and coming back down is fun. You get a little bit of weightlessness, but to actually do, you know, to get some value out of your flight, you t use that parabolic arc, you know, above the atmosphere, above, you know, there's no sonic booms, you just get out of the atmosphere, fly 20, you know, Mach 20, and then reappear somewhere else on the Earth and, and re-enter the atmosphere and, and land, and you can get point-to-point -point anywhere on Earth for, you know, in, within a couple of hours, which I think is, yeah. that gets really interesting. So, I mean, I if would say this isn't looking at that as all part of the machine, right? Like, let's look at some stuff that's Concord, let's look at some stuff that's the actual point-to-point -point anywhere on Earth, like, that's the future of this whole process. Yeah, I agree, and I would see this as, uh, you know, the first sort of small step in that direction, because, you know, it's a big enough uh, task simply to start a new airline. Uh, it's an even larger task to start a new airline uh, with a new sort of supersonic jet uh, that hasn't been used successfully in decades, uh, and it's a, you know, maybe impossible task to start an airline uh, with uh, a space plane. And so I think Virgin Galactic, uh, if their true intention is to uh, operate these um, sort of long duration or long distance short duration flights, they're taking a sensible first step, uh, and they can establish ground operations and a customer base and you know experience turning around high performance uh, aircraft uh, on a short basis uh, far far more rapidly than they're ever going to be able to turn around space tourism, and this may provide some form of steady income uh, before they can to fund sort of what will be the next generation of, um, of spacecraft that would then maybe allow them to start doing these sorts of flights. Yeah, and, and you know, Blue Origins is trying to get into the same game as well. So I think there's a whole new round of companies attempting this kind of thing. So it's all going to get pretty interesting. Yeah, it's an exciting time. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, move back to Kimberly. Let's talk about ancient polar ice revealing the tilting of Earth's moon. Sure. So we're going back into the solar system now, uh, and a very, very interesting discovery by a large collaboration of lunar 
uh, observations that showed that the tilt of the Earth's moon has actually shifted by about five degrees since the time it formed. And the shift happened to occur uh, about three billion years ago. So it's been pretty steady for the past three billion years, but about three billion years ago, or about uh, one and a half billion years after it formed, something dramatic happened that uh, shifted the tilt of the moon's orbit by about five degrees, which is quite a large shift. And they were able to determine this by looking at the pattern of the ice uh, on the Earth's moon's two poles. And this is a, it was a combination of observations from the Lunar Prospector, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, Lunar Crater Observation Sensing Satellite, which is LCROSS, uh, Gravity Recovery and Interior, the Interior Laboratory, a, a bunch of different lunar observations, and they were able to age date the ice on the poles of the moon uh, to about three billion years ago. But right next to it were areas where uh, it's clear that ice used to be there, but is no longer there. And that can only happen if those areas of the moon's poles used to be in shadow and then were very suddenly thrust into sunlight, which rapidly evaporated all of the water ice from those areas. And from the pattern of the ice and the areas that ice used to be, they were able to determine that it was about five degree shift. And they don't know quite why the, the orbit shifted quite so drastically. That's a very big change, and they don't know why, but they were able to determine that something like this happened, which gives us to, a clue that after the moon formed, the Earth-moon system was not quite as stable as we used to think it was. So it gives us a, a clue as to the changing orbital dynamics of the inner solar system at the time. Well, they've known, or the, you know, they suspected that the, that um, sorry, Mars has had fairly big uh, tilt changes over over time, and mm -hmm. maybe even even the Earth. So I wonder if some kind of interaction between Earth's changing tilt, or you know, would have some kind of interaction with with the Moon. I'm I'm not sure if if Morgan does, sure does this. Yeah, Morgan, does this sort of fit into your wheelhouse a bit? Can you say this? Sorry, I didn't hear. It broke up on me for a second. There, what the question oh, was? Oh, just just sort of like what kinds of mechanisms might cause the the moon to tilt over time? You know, could it be some interaction with the Earth's tilt over time, or or is it just it settling down before it finally fully locked? So neither the moon or the Earth are perfectly spherical, uh, and neither of their orbits are perfectly round. Uh, and what this can introduce is. Um, over time, slow drifts of um, the orientations of these um, objects. In fact, we can see the moon, even today, wobbles back and forth as it orbits around uh, the sun. And the favorite planetary science explanation for any uh, anomalous thing would certainly be that something enormous hit it and knocked it um, askew, but that's probably less likely than imagining that uh, that the Earth, that the Moon formed in one orientation, and because it's been sort of tweaking the Earth, and the Earth's been tweaking it uh, over the course of the last few billion years, it's caused uh, that orbit, or that pole, the direction of that pole to kind of wander around, exposing uh, areas that would have originally formed uh, in shadow and allowed the ice to, um, to cool there. So, so Kimberly, I mean, does this mean that you know it may want to change the places that the scientists are looking for ice? Like it sort of opens up new, new spots and vistas to look for, for you know, past evidence of water on the moon. I mean, we've always known where the the, the current ice poles are on the moon, and so we know where to look for the water ice, and we know now that there used to be ice in other parts of the moon. But I think the more significant understanding that we're gaining is the age of the ice on the moon, which is which can be a really interesting uh, piece of science to understand, and then understanding how uh, the ice used to interact with the other parts of the moon, and we can sort of see the evolution of of how the lunar surface and the lunar ice have interacted over the past few billion years. Uh, someone is saying on the chat that the phases of the moon at needs to account for the shift. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll put that in. If you go back far enough, the, the actual tilt of the moon will have to change. Um, we'll have to add that in. 
Yeah. Do you think that that this is going on to other more objects in the solar system as well? I mean, if we find, you know, if we suspect it on Mars, we seem to find it on the moon. I mean, does it mean that the solar system, the early solar system, was a much more dynamic place than maybe, you know, we think now? I, I think definitely. I, I think we really don't have an understanding yet of how we've gotten to the orbital configurations that we have right now. And like Morgan said, uh, sorry, like uh, Morgan said, sorry, Morgan, <laughs> talking too fast. Um, the very few of the orbits in the solar system are perfectly circular. Very few of the bodies in the, so in the solar system are perfectly circular, and that introduces a lot of interesting dynamics that could still be changing the orbits of uh, planets and moons. I mean, we just are now seeing evidence of Planet Nine based on the orbits of Kuiper Belt objects and things. We don't understand how things in our solar system are even working now. So I think going back even further uh, can can give us. I don't think we understand those orbital dynamics even at all. Yeah, and I guess we don't have enough uh, evidence or any evidence of exo moons yet to be able to sort right. of take a look at them. So. Um, Cool. Okay, so I think we got one last story from uh, from Morgan about more moons, and these are Saturn's inner moons and when they formed. Yeah, this was a, a perfect segue because the area of physics that we've been talking about is uh, an area known as dynamics, and dynamics is perhaps the oldest field uh, of astrophysics, and it basically has to do with understanding the motions, the orbits of planets and stars and other objects. Um, with respect to one another. And Saturn is perhaps the most interesting uh, laboratory for dynamics in the whole solar system because it has 62 moons, uh, 60 of which lie outside of the rings, two of which are embedded uh, within the rings. It has the solar system's second largest moon, perhaps the solar system's smallest moons, uh, rings scattered throughout that whole system. And it's been a large challenge for dynamicists to try to understand how did we arrive at the configuration we have today and how long has that configuration persisted. Uh, and what work this week um, has suggested is that perhaps um, the orbits and in fact the existence of many of the moons we see today might not date back to the beginning of the solar system but rather date back just a few hundred million years. And the way they figured this out was to set up a simulation of all of the motion of the objects in the solar system, or in the, sorry, in the Saturn system, and then to basically run time backwards. And what they found is if they ran time backwards, given our current assumptions and understandings about the motions of these objects, you would re reach a situation relatively quickly uh, that basically wasn't plausible. This they would be in places doing things that they simply couldn't have been doing. And they proposed two solutions to this problem. One solution is actually that the orbits of these objects in general uh, are changing much more slowly than perhaps we've been observing over the, the current uh, period of time. The other suggestion uh, that uh, they had was that these objects just aren't that old. And thus, sure, they've actually been moving pretty quickly for the um, period of time we've observed them because you don't have to run time back four and a half billion years. You only have to run time back a few hundred million years. Uh, and they eliminated that first option that I suggested, the idea that they've really just been evolving relatively slowly by looking at the moon Enceladus. Uh, and we know Enceladus for its uh, enormous geysers uh, shooting nearly pure water out of uh, the interior of a liquid water ocean buried beneath Enceladus. Uh, and in order to, to maintain an ocean like that and to generate enough heat to create geysers like we see uh, in the extreme cold of the Saturn system, you need to generate a ton of heat. Uh, in fact, more heat than we can account for given our current understanding. That's sort of a separate problem. Uh, but in order, the one way that we know to generate a lot of heat like that uh, is to have the orbits change quickly. And because when the orbits change quickly, um, the fact that there aren't spheres t comes into play. And you sort of stretch and squish these objects. And you can imagine stretching and squishing a solid object that's going to generate a lot of heat. It causes the ice, which is as hard as rock, where Saturn is, to rub back and forth on one another. And if you rub two rocks together, you'll uh, generate heat here on Earth. And so they say, well, because we see 
uh, Enceladus today, we know that at least some objects in, in the Saturn system must have been evolving really quickly. And if they're evolving really quickly, they must not be that old, or they would have undergone way more change than we see uh, today. And, and because of this, they suggest that a few hundred million years ago, many of the sort of small and intermediate moons that lie between the main rings of Saturn today and the big outer moon of Titan uh, probably formed out of a large uh, icy ring that is now no longer present. Uh, and this kind of just reinforces this really complicated picture that we have at Saturn, where the rings seem to be forming moons, uh, but over larger periods of time, these moons might smack into one another and shatter and go back to forming rings again. And then that new ring would form over a period of hundreds of millions of years uh, its own set of moons. And so that unlike, uh, say, at Jupiter, where we can be relatively certain that uh, the large moons of Jupiter have been in existence for the entire age of the solar system, uh, much of what we see at Saturn today could be just a fleeting glimpse of what has been occurring over the last uh, few billion years. So looking at Saturn uh, hundreds of millions or billions of years ago, the, the environment would look totally different. And seeing it again billions of years from now might look different again. Yeah, that's the uh, implication of, of this work, and it's an implication that isn't uh, in disagreement with a lot of other uh, work that has been under taken. Almost everyone, even if you imagine that the rings formed billions of years ago, uh, almost everyone imagines that the, the moons we see today once originally formed out of the rings. And then it's simply a question of uh, when did that happen and are we seeing the first cycle of this or has this been a process that has been renewing itself uh, over the life of the solar system. So what does 2016 Morgan say about the age of Saturn's rings? So we sit kind of on a precipice right now uh, because we have a lot of compelling evidence that suggests that the rings must be relatively young. We have compelling evidence that suggests the rings must be relatively old. Uh, fortunately, uh, 2017 Morgan will have hopefully a much more definitive answer about this because one of the very last observations that Cassini is going to hopefully try and make before plunging into Saturn is to measure the mass of the rings. And it's going to do that by flying between the rings and the planet, as opposed to the last 13 years where we've simply orbited outside of the rings the entire time. And then we'll feel Saturn basically tugging in one direction on the spacecraft and the rings tugging in the other direction on the spacecraft. Uh, and that'll change the velocity of the spacecraft a little bit. And we'll hopefully from Earth be able to measure that small change in velocity. And that will tell us how much the rings uh, weigh. And the mass of the rings will be the most important piece of evidence we have to determining whether or not the rings are, are, are old or young. Because all of the observations we have now um, are basically dependent on how much the rings actually uh, weigh. And that's something we don't really even know within, a, say, a factor of 10. But I mean, this is one of the great things about science, though, right? Because you know, I know that we had this conversation in 2015, and you probably would have come on the side of the rings are old. And now you sound like you're kind of in the middle. And now we're going to find out what happens with, with, as you said, 2017 Morgan. And this is great, right? Like science just continues to gather the evidence and make its decision based on what seems like you know where the where the where the most evidence is. Falling. Yeah, and this is ultimately going to be the legacy of Cassini at Saturn. Uh, just like, I think, with observations of Mercury and the Moon and Mars, we're realizing that the solar system is a far more dynamic place today uh, than we ever had previously imagined. Uh, Cassini has revealed that Saturn, sort of a microcosm of this activity, is remarkably more dynamic than we could have possibly imagined uh, even after the Voyager flybys. And it's really shed a whole bunch of new light on the evolution of moon systems around planets, the evolution of uh, planets around the sun, and you know, when combined with what we've observed with the search for exoplanets, we realize that nothing really is static about uh, the solar system, the local universe, the galaxy, etc. 
it's going to be really sad not to have a spacecraft at Saturn after all this time. We got very comfortable to have that spacecraft there, and when Absolutely. we lose it, it's going to really suck. Yeah, it's almost every week it seems we get some new beautiful picture or result uh, from Saturn. And, you know, after Cassini ends next year, it could be a decade, it could be three decades uh, yeah. before we get any more results like that. All right, well, on that note, why don't we, uh, why don't we wrap things up? So, uh, Brian Coberline, where do people find out more? Uh, you can find me on my website, which is briancoberline.com, and you can find me on Google+, and you can find me at Forbes. So I'm all over the place. And and is there any Patreon goals that people can contribute to that make you become their dancing monkey? Yeah, I haven't gotten to the video things yet, so i got to reach the, the 500 limit. I'm not there yet. Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to help. Um, okay. Uh, Kimberly Cartier, where do people find out more? People can find out more by following me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier, by visiting my website, KimberlyCartier.org. And if you happen to be in the Buffalo, New York area on April 16th, you can come check out my talk at the Buffalo Astronomical Association's annual banquet. So hopefully I will see some of you there. That's awesome. Uh, Morgan, where do people find out more? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg or visit my website, morganrenberg.com. Uh, I got one last question here that that Patrick uh, Festo is pretty wants to know, and I he's asked a couple of times, which is just the size of the star uh, that we talked about, Brian, the R136A1. How big is it? Uh, there's a picture out that shows them in comparison size to the sun. It's uh, I wouldn't want to guess what yeah. of magnitude. I mean, the the I somebody did a video about what the biggest star in the universe is. Uh, you might be able to yeah. search that up. Um, but uh, I, I know that the you know the, those supermassive red giant stars reach out beyond, say, the orbit of Saturn. If they right. were sort of in our solar system, although some of the more massive ones aren't necessarily the biggest ones. It's some of the cooler ones are the bigger ones. And right. I think I, I asked a, a researcher on this and the largest theoretical size is, is 2,500 times the size of the sun. Which right. is enormous. large. But, but it's mostly vacuum. Yeah, yeah, when you get that big, it's, a, it's all <laughs> fluffy and fairly cool. Right. So, yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, so once again, I'm Fritzer Kane. You can, uh, if you haven't already, click subscribe on this uh on this video, which would be great. Subscribe on the, the YouTube channel, and that way you'll get a notification of when our show begins. Um, you'd want to go in and modify your notifications to make sure that you get them. Uh, a big thanks to Nancy Graziano and the folks from uh, Sophia for for joining us this week. What a treat to have the us broadcasting live from the hangar, which is just amazing, and getting a chance to see the, the actual aircraft. Uh, more of that, please. That would be great. Um, cool. So the, so thanks again to everyone for watching. Thanks, everyone, for everyone participating. Uh, make sure you go to the WSH Crew website and uh, participate in the uh, planning of the show, choosing guests. This is the community that actually makes these shows happen, and you get to be a part of it. Uh, and we'd love to have your help and assistance. All right. We'll see you all next week. Happy Friday. Happy Friday.